What is up, freaks? It's your boy Marty Ben here to introduce this episode of Tales from the Crypt. Sat down with Lamar Wilson, the founder of the Black Bitcoin Billionaires Club on Clubhouse. Met him on Clubhouse recently and, and decided to have him on the podcast. Talk about what he's doing, how he got into Bitcoin, how he's trying to spread Bitcoin throughout the black community, a bunch of other stuff. This episode is brought to you by our good friends at the motherfucking Cash App. Camera just fell in case you heard that bump back there. Cash App's help you stack sats, send sats, receive sats, and sell sats. If you so please. We're saying sats, 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 sats because sats are the standard. If you are new to Bitcoin, you're wondering what the hell your Uncle Marty is screaming into the mic right now. What are these sats you speak of? One Bitcoin can be broken down into 100 million units. 100 million units. There are, and they're known as satoshis or sats. So there are 100 million sats in one Bitcoin. You stack 100 million sats, you have one Bitcoin. And we like to sat, stack sats. And you can do it via the Cash App by as little as $1. DCA into sats. That's dollar cost average. You set a a cadence at which you buy a, a set amount. And you can do that daily, weekly, or bi weekly on the Cash App. And you say, hey, I'm going to buy 20 bucks a day. Set it and forget it. And you're just stacking sats in the background. I actually talked about it with Lamar. That's what they're they're trying to entice people to do in the, in the uh, Black Bitcoin Billionaires Club is, is get people to get to the uh, the million sats club. I'm a, a Sats millionaire. I like that. Catch up has a, a Sats back boost as well. If you go and you use your boost card wherever Visa is accepted and you have your, your Bitcoin boost initiated, you can get some Sats back. What else is going on? Catch up can be your bank account. You have account numbers and routing numbers. You want to get your paycheck direct deposited into the app? You can do that. Cash App to help you do all this. If you haven't downloaded it yet, make sure you do. When you do, use the code stacking sats. That's S T A C K I N G S A T S. You're going to get $10, and $10 is going to go to Owls Lacrosse. That's Owls Lacrosse. Enjoy this episode, freaks. Dickie. You've had a dynamic where money's become freer than free. If you talk about a Fed just gone nuts, all, all the central banks going nuts. So it's all acting like safe haven. I believe that in a world where central bankers are tripping over themselves to devalue their currency, Bitcoin wins. In the world of fiat currencies, Bitcoin is the victor. I mean, that's part of the bull case for Bitcoin. If you're not paying attention, you probably should be. You probably should be. You probably should be. What is up, freaks? Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. It's your boy Marty Bent here. The Tuesday afternoon. It's Tuesday. I almost lost track of, of the day here. Lamar. I'm sitting down with Lamar Wilson, who I've met recently on Clubhouse. Uh, you started the club, uh, Black Bitcoin Billionaires, which is one of the hottest Bitcoin clubs on Clubhouse. Uh, and it's just been uh, incredible to learn more about you, uh, your perspective on Bitcoin and how it applies to the Black community. And just wanted to get you on here to learn more about Lamar Wilson, why he started this clubhouse, your Bitcoin journey personally, and just shoot the shit about what's going thank on you, in the bro. world today. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. Well, thank yeah. you for coming on. So what, uh, <laughs> before we get into the clubhouse, like how, how did you get into the Bitcoin space? How did you find Bitcoin? Well, look, man, I, I'm a software developer. Again, um, my name is Lamar Wilson, software developer. And I had a game application that was like, we were trying to put, make Chuck E. Cheese online where people could play online games and like you could win tickets and get real prizes from Amazon. So it sounds good on surface, right? Everybody wants to win prizes. Well, we went out to get funding for that. And um, one of the VCs was like, I see you have your own digital currency in your game system. Have you ever heard of Bitcoin? And I was like, Bitcoin? I was like, I thought he said big coin, like big. I was like, what? So we walk out and my business partner, he's like, nah, man, I think he's talking about Bitcoin. He shows me the page and I read it for a second. And, you know, arrogant software developer, dude got his own startup. I'm like, man, what is this? Nah, we ain't doing this. This is different. Gave the phone back to him. But then the headlines come and I think it like hit 200 and something dollars. And it was like a high at the time. And I was like, I was like, man, this thing is real. 
So I went and uh, looked up the white paper and that was it. Because I, when I read the white paper, I didn't see money. I didn't see like where it's at now. All I saw was freedom. All I said was I'm a software developer and I have a finance degree. Like I graduated honors in my, in, in my university, University of Kentucky in finance. So I have a finance degree and I'm a software developer. So Bitcoin is like perfect marriage, right? And so when I saw it, I was like, man, this is freedom. This, this allows me to control my own money. I can program it. I can do what I want with it. I don't have to go ask a bank. Like all of that just looked like freedom and self-sovereignty to me. And I'm, I'm all, all about that all day. So I go down the rabbit hole, man. And like most people do, and I didn't sleep that entire night, woke up the next morning. I mean, not woke up, but my partner woke up the next morning. I was like, man, what you been doing? I said, all night, bro. I can't go to sleep. It's like freaking drugs. I was like, I keep looking at this. I read every article. I read the white paper. I started learning about cryptography. He was like, you talking about Bitcoin? I was like, yeah, the Bitcoin. He's like, man, I had a dream about Bitcoin. And I told him, I said, look, man, I'm going to build something for this. And he was like, well, he was like, I'll go ahead and keep running our other business. You know what I'm saying? And you do what you got to do. So I went down the rabbit hole and learned how to build a wallet. And so we built a wallet called the Fever Wallet, which is we took the name from the failed gaming application that we had. So the Fever Wallet came into existence um, and I programmed that. And he designed it. He's a designer. And so we, we got it out there into the world. Um, and the crazy part is, is that at the time they had banned all wallets on iOS devices. Like, I remember that. You remember that? Yeah. Um, but we figured out a way to get people our wallet. And so that's what made us kind of novel. Um, and also people thought we were scammy because how did they beat Apple? But they don't realize like we actually did it the right way. We called Apple, talked to them, made sure everything was good. And so when we were when we went to Texas Bitcoin Conference to launch it, it was like it was a big thing because at the time nobody could get a wallet on their iPhone. And so that's how we met most of the people in the space. That was what, 2014, I believe. Um, and so 2013 was like my learning year. And then 2014 was like, the coming out party. Right. Um, but that was, I mean, that was really, really cool, man. It was like us getting, <clears throat> us getting everything, um, into a wallet and actually using it. We did some things like coin IDs, which is like paid to just the name, which is, which made it a lot easier for people. And we did, um, gift. So like you could buy gift cards in our wallet and go get, uh, and go get stuff in the store. The cool part is we had the, probably the best freaking, um, Bitcoin uh, commercial of all times. It's still on YouTube. You gotta go check it out. It's the Fever P H E E V A and the G Y F T commercial. Go check it out, man. But um, but yeah, that's how I pretty much got into it, and we we built that built that software, and then just continued on in the space, and then wind up building Hydro. I kind of um, invented the use of blockchain for open trade finance. I wrote the book on it, so to speak, in GTR in the Global Trade Review. So. Um, I've always just looked at the technology as being something to, to free people, right? Um, and Bitcoin in general to, to actually, cause it, it doesn't care about your race, sex, anything. Like you can run a full node, write a wallet and nobody can tell you that you can, can or cannot participate in the network. It's the beauty <laughs> of it, right? It's like, that's what drew me to it too. Like I came from a finance background. I came from more like a sound money. Like I, I don't really have a so software background, but I was covering the Fed at, at a job I worked for out of college. And just like these people have no idea what they're doing. And we're sort of like stuck being beholden to the decisions they make. And the decisions they make affect millions and hundreds of millions of people, and right. billions of people around the world. And it extends beyond U.S. borders, what the Fed does. And that, that ability to free yourself from that, that system uh, and, and transitioned into Bitcoin and really take sovereignty over your wealth is, is extremely powerful. And, and then you apply right. that to uh, communities and, and demographics of people throughout the United States and across the world who have been uh, subjected to a weaponized financial system and, and the, the potential for this to uplift hundreds right. of millions, billions of people is, is massive. And it's just incredible to be alive right now and see this message getting out there and that's one thing i like about the message that you've been spreading is is, is just honing in on that freedom aspect that this will free you and that's powerful right it's like the fed is in power and bitcoin empowers right you know what i'm saying i'm more about 
empowerment than I am being empowered over anyone. I'm, I'm one of those people that believes that you should lead yourself. And like, if you are inspired by someone and you have all the information, you're leading yourself. It's not that they're leading you. It's just that they have inspired you. I giving you enough information to make your own decision to move forward. Right. And I think that's, that's what Bitcoin does. It empowers people to have that kind of power, right? And not necessarily be in power over top of someone else where you, where you control someone else, you know? Yeah. And it connects people like yeah. of all different races, creeds, uh, sex, age, right. demographic, like over that, that, that ability to empower the individual. Like and that's, yeah. that's like what I'm so excited for. Cause like a, a lot of Obviously, the inequality in, in this country particularly has been exacerbated to a point where you have people hitting the streets and, and especially after the lockdowns and everything that's going on, like there's, there's a lot of social right. in, incohesion, right? And, and this technology, Bitcoin, allows people to, to opt out of the system that's driving that incohesion and focus on solutions, which is fixing the money. Like I like to say a lot, like fix the money, fix the world. Because <laughs> like, right. again, like, the system's been weaponized against people. Oh, for sure, for sure. And that, like, what you're saying is like what dra- what drives me, especially as a black man in this country. Because foundationally, black people are the foundation. We are the the capital, right? We are the original capital that really pushed this co- this country forward. And so, when you think about that, it's like, like you said, the money, the monetary part of it has been weaponized because you use money to then keep people enslaved. And that money is also the reason why people wanted slaves so they could get more money. Right. And it's like, it wasn't, it wasn't until we started to realize, like, like we can have this kind of power through a technology that I think that people are starting to understand the freedom. Cause I really believe that a lot of people are still enslaved today that are not necessarily black because they don't understand how the Fed lends money out to the government and also to businesses and bank, I mean, to banks, then the banks lend money out to the businesses and then the businesses lend money to us. And so each step along the way, you just created a new slave. And so the Fed is kind of like the slave master for the entire country, right? Because you, you're running this entire system on debt and you run it in a situation where once, once you borrow this money, then we're going to put more money into the system to devalue the money that you have to make it harder for you to get other things, which means you're going to need more debt. So <laughs> it's like, it's crazy, man. It's a cycle. It's a cycle of slavery, man. And they've monetary, just gotten, they've gotten all of slavery. Us, yeah. They've gotten all of us to buy into it. Like everybody has bought into it. They don't realize like that's exactly what the system is for to keep you working. Like it's not to free you. It's not to get you into a situation where you don't have to work as much. It's really like, the more we co- go forward, the more I keep pumping dollars in, the more you're going to have to work. And because of that, that means you can't have, you know, one person stay at home with the children, whether it be the man or the woman. You can't, you have to have two people working out, right? You have to have people taking penitentiary chances just to eat. You know what I mean? Like that stuff comes from the type of society we built on. And that also creates a gap between the haves and the have nots that be, makes for more instability. And in, in a country that is full of abundance, it's crazy to me, man. Crazy. It's, I mean, right? Like we, we've essentially been enslaved. And most people don't know it, right? Like the the hamster wheel of being, like you just mentioned, being forced to, to work paycheck to paycheck. Right. Just to stay afloat. Like people just think that's the way the world's supposed to work, but it's really, really not. <laughs> it's right. fucking scary that we've gotten to this point. We have right. the the ability to to enslave the masses being driven by like very few people when you think about the the number of people that actually control this system and and pull the levers <laughs> and enslave the rest of the population it's the wizards, crazy the wizard of the you right? know it's re- you know it's really crazy too man it's like i was telling my son as i said when i was 16 i worked at waffle house and made 10 bucks an hour Matter of fact, it might have been like 1090, right? As a cook, as a mid-shift cook. He, right now, he worked a job to make 10 bucks an hour. And that's like 20 years later. So think about it. Prices of goods have gone up. Wages stayed low. What does that sound like to you? Like, it sounds like slavery. It's like, we're going to pay you less and less 
and make you and charge you more and more so that you have to work more and more just to get the goods and stuff that you that you're trying to get. Yeah, it creates this it creates this rat race that like it's impossible <laughs> to get out of and like it, not only a rat race but a desperation like like doesn't it right. seem like our society's dr- been driven to a point of desperation like on all sides like, like we've seen uh like people storming the capitol uh last <laughs> right. year like the, the, the black lives matter protests from last year like the, the there's something wrong and i so like so that's something i've been saying a lot on this podcast is that the the narrative and the framing of the conversation that that's giving to us that's force fed to us from the mainstream media it's like red team versus blue team yep and people are forced to choose sides between those two teams where like it really distracts everybody from the main crux of the problem which is like right. how the money is created and distributed and right. how unfair that that particular process is if we can get more people to stop thinking red team versus blue team and think hey we need to fix the money everybody will be much better off as a result right it's the common enemy right you have to find that common enemy and the truth is is that like you said the money situation is the common enemy because you know it's so weird in this country man like i talk about that uh a lot i've been talking about that for a long time on the internet but it's just weird in this country that the government advertises the lottery to the poorest people, right? But at the same time, they hardly ever allow the, the poorest people to make investments into companies, into startup companies, which are, you know, the ways that most of our uh, billionaires are billionaires. Like, if you look at it, most of them are tech company founders that have created uh, companies out of investment from LPs. But nobody who is poor can take those kind of chances which that's inequality, man. Like, how do you have a capitalist country, quote unquote, capitalist country that doesn't allow everyone to participate at the same time under the guise of we need to protect you from, (laughs) we need to protect you from yourself. Like you don't understand well enough, which is the craziest thing to me because at 17 years old, I started investing into penny stocks because I was interested and me losing through that tuition, I call that tuition, me losing money made me go actually go research who's a good investor, who was Warren Buffett. So then when I found Warren Buffett, I went and found Benjamin Graham and read The Intelligent Investor. So I just, it's, it, because I was able to lose, it sent me down a path to try to figure out how to win. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But then, then, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, then you factor in like the fact that we live in the internet age and most people have access to the same amount of information due to the fact that they can access the internet very cheaply. It right. sort of erodes that argument that you need to be protected from yourself. Right. Like, like if you're that, that's just the that, listen, protection protection from yourself is always a way to create a gate. That's all it is. Yeah. It just it's just always a way to create a gate and 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 to continue the culture of gatekeepers. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I think we're I think we're making a ruckus. I think they're starting to get scared, especially with Bitcoin. And, and like that's that's the thing that excites me the most is that like, if we, again, if we can shift the framing of the narrative from red team versus blue team, like to, most, yeah. most people have more, in, the people fighting in the streets have more in common than they, than they do with the leaders that are framing that narrative, forcing them into the streets, right? Like, it's, it's always me. And like, even if people don't understand, like during reconstruction, right, right after slavery, like poor whites and black people were so similar that they started working together. Yeah. But then what happened was there was a narrative that was implanted that was basically like, these black people are going to take your jobs. Which we see that same narrative get put into the whole idea of uh, the Mexicans, right? Mexicans are coming across to take your jobs. So then you start creating this division underneath to fight over scraps that the people who are creating that division, they don't have to fight over those scraps. They're the ones throwing the scraps in and letting you continue to fight. Exactly. Not realizing that you getting scraps of the pig, but the whole pig is right, right above you. If everybody just turns and says, "Oh, let's go get the pig," <laughs> right? It changes the entire narrative. Yeah, and that came back in the 20th century too, like jazz music and like the war on drugs and marijuana. Like same like, thing. Yeah, it's like, it happens over and over again, and it's like because you come from if you come from a mind, uh, mind uh, set of scarcity, that's what's going to continuously happen. Like if you keep thinking that everything is so scarce, 
right? People will fight each other to get it, right? And in this situation, but here's the difference. In this situation, Bitcoin will become more scarce in the future, right? But we can opt in now. It's, it's not somebody that can tell us that we can't opt into it right now, right? There's nobody stopping us like, well, we're going to make it, we're going to make it scarce, like, uh, by our own, you know, telling who can actually have things and create these walls and say, we're going to keep it scarce for certain people, but not for others. In this situation, everybody got the same chance to go get these Bitcoin. <laughs> like, right. And that's right. like, that's the beauty of it. And then like, even it's scarce nature makes it. So even if you are a late adopter, you're going to benefit from Bitcoin. You may not benefit as much as some of the early adopters, but right. the fact that it is a sound monetary good that, that really helps drive down prices and allows you to save capital over time and accumulate right. capital is good for, for anybody who adopts it at any given point in time. Right. That's a, that's making like, it worth more in the future. Yeah. It's always way better. Not making it worth less. So you have to work more. Right. right. For a lot of people who got in early, right. Like us, I don't know how early, how early was you in, man? Uh, Around the same time, like I started paying attention a little bit in 2012 and then 2013, 2014 is when I went like full down. And yeah, you knew about like me. So us that have been in for a while, what you start noticing is, is as the value of it goes up, you have, to, you can work less. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, it's like, it's not a system of always having to keep working. It's like the thing that the asset I own is actually allowing me to take more of my time back. You well, know what I'm saying? When you don't even necessarily have to work less. You can work on things you actually want to work on. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what I mean. You have right? you can work less on like trying to survive, so to speak. You can get out of the rat race. And like, that's what I don't think people really understand the the power of Bitcoin and, and the specifically as it pertains to it giving you the ability to accumulate capital and 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 not rest on your laurels, but take a step back and actually decide what you want to do. Like the, right. imagine the creativity and the productivity that's going to be unleashed. Now that people don't have to sit in goddamn cubes and crunching Excel, <laughs> and man, like things that are soul crushing and they actually don't want to do. Imagine people being able to accumulate capital and actually focus their energy on things they do want to do, whether it be right. creative, creatively or productively. Um, and I think the working class, and I think the working class needs it the most, right? Because as automation comes in, those jobs and the ability to earn wages is going to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's going to leave. So it's like, if you have another way to earn outside of your ability to earn wages, that's going to help you have a better life in the future, I believe. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, man, it's, there's a whole lot of things that are, you know, that, that we need to continue to, cause I, I think we, we talk about price so much that it gets people not focused on the right things with Bitcoin. I think we need to continue to focus on the philosophy behind it because the philosophy is about independent freedom, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's about trustlessness. It's about, you know, uh, not having to trust some other individual and it's about access, like real talk, man. So yeah, good stuff, man. It's a good, it's a good conversation, brother. <laughs> uh, well, that's what we try to do here at Tales from the Crypt, right? And like, again, like you're a family, man. I had, my son is about to be one years old. I just had, uh, my wife and I had our first child last year. Congrats. And thank you. But like we, we've been describing like the fact that, uh, Bitcoin's forced both parents or not Bitcoin, the, the fiat monetary system has forced both parents into the workforce to, to make sure that they can just put food on the table and, and to assist paycheck to paycheck. But, um, Bitcoin's given me the ability to, to my wife got laid off during the whole COVID locks that lockdowns. And, um, I've been able to tell her, you know, what, you don't need to look for a job. Just, just relax and, and raise our, raise our son and, and I, take care of it. And I think that so that's another thing that's really been eroded here in the U S is the nuclear family. And that's the corner. Uh, society, right. I want to hug you right now, bro. Cause I think about that all the time. That's what I tell you. That's what I tell these cats in the black Bitcoin billionaire all the time is like, some people are like, when should I get in? How much money should I put in? And I'm like, listen, the most important thing, you can't have generational wealth unless you have generations out. Right. Right. So if you're not taking care of your family and if you if you risk it more than your family can ha can handle, then you're not doing what's prudent. Like Bitcoin is great, but your family is greater. 
know what I'm saying? Your own, your own sanity, your mental is greater, right? Like if your mind's not right and you fighting and you wind up getting into it with your wife and you break your family apart and your kids don't have the dad, right? Like that stuff is far more important than just making sure you have this value. Once you get that understood, then you can understand how much you need to put into Bitcoin, right? But I think most people, you know, they just like, oh, but I just got to get out. I got to get out. I got to get out. But there's there are always consequences to that mentality. And that got to get out is the reason why we stay in the rat race, too. Right. right? Bitcoin is simply a means to get to the end of a strong family. At least for me, that's like what I. Man, that's it, Doc. Because look, you being able to bring your wife home. Think about it. That's cool. Like that adds a different layer. It adds a different layer to your son. You know what I'm saying? Like it's it's like to have your mom there, the one that teaches you, that that adds a, a good core nuclear foundation for your son, man. That's 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 dope stuff. Right? No, no. I was I saw a funny tweet the other day. Some people may may find it uncouth, but somebody tweet I forget exactly who. But they're like, why am I going to send my my wife to work to to have a a work husband and so that we can send her <laughs> child to school to be raised by another woman? It's like, no, that's real. Like yes, man, that is so real, bro. That is so real. He's like we all have we all have these other families because we have work, and I've seen so many families be torn apart because of work, because you spend more hours with your work family than you do your own family, all in the guise of making yourself a better family. Right? It's <laughs> so convoluted, man. It's like what? It makes no sense. Oh, but yeah, man. <clears throat> but yeah, speaking. So speaking of the uh, black Bitcoin billionaires, man, I um. I'm so glad that, you know, we've been getting a lot of love on um, Clubhouse. And, you know, right now we're the biggest Bitcoin club by members. Of course, people are clicking on Bitcoin, the club, because they just see Bitcoin. But by members, we have the most members on Clubhouse. And I think that's really cool because a lot of people would say, well, you guys are black. Like, does that mean that we can't be involved? I'm like, no, no mean that at all. All it means is it's a smoke signal, right? It's like, hey, we're black over here. We're marketing to black people because in this space for so many years, the one thing that I always thought was missing in me and my, uh, my, my business partner, Leif, my good friend, Leif, um, we always were like, if they really want mass adoption in this space, everybody needs to focus on black people and women because black people and women are viral. You understand what I'm <laughs> saying? Like we spread things, bro. Like look at black Twitter. Black Black Twitter holds up all of Twitter. You know what I'm saying? This Look at true. Clubhouse. Like without club, without black people being in, in, uh, injected into Clubhouse, it was boring, right? It was a bunch of VCs standing around circle jerking. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, circle yeah, jerks and, get boring after a while. Yeah, you. Yeah, people's hand get raw. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's a uh, Cash App too, right? I got Cash yeah, App cash sponsors out. this podcast. Yeah. Um, the black billionaires club. And like that, that came up in the inner cities. Like I talked to the product managers at cash app and they're like, yeah, this, this started like yeah. in the inner cash cities. App, cash app and clubhouse viral. are the blackest apps on the app store, man. <laughs> By far. But that's the thing. It's like, but here's the thing that I was going to say. It's like cash app understands and values like the black, like how black people do bring that culture. Right. Um, Clubhouse, they they got it because just just by proxy, because people invited two tastemakers, they kind of blew the whole thing up. I think in the Bitcoin and crypto space, there aren't people who actually value that that much. And I think that's what's going to change. And that's the reason why we created Black Bitcoin Billionaires, because we understand the value that Black people bring to anything, right? Yeah. But when you're devalued, right? When you're devalued for a long time, then people just say, well, it doesn't matter. We're still going to get big without these people, without this whole entire group of individuals. And women are the same. Like I said, women are exactly the same to me. It's like not exactly the same, but, you know, very similar because women have their own whole set of issues they have to deal with. But I think a lot of times, especially in technical spaces, we don't focus on black people. And so I always saw it like it wasn't like people were marketing their conference. Conference will be in Chicago. And there would only be three black people at the conference. Like, you know how crazy it's in Chicago, bro. Conference would be in DC, a place that is has normally been called Chocolate City. And there would be four black people at the entire Bitcoin conference, right? 
That's crazy. Like it's it, like it's un it's unfathomable to think that you're not marketing because those people have money. Black people have money too. But it's crazy that you go to a city that is full of African Americans and you're not marketing to the people that are in that city, right? You, you could care less, so to speak. And I start and then and that one oh, was Bitcoin on the Beltway. That was a very small conference. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm looking around like y'all could have went down the street and got just as many people, right? Well, yeah, I think that's a product of, of Bitcoiners just focusing on the individual, right? Like, again, like Bitcoin doesn't care what color. No, but they market. It's marketing, though, right? Like you yeah. market it. So who are you? It's, it's like, what channels are you marketing to? And that's what I'm saying. It's like, I think and it's not it's not anybody's fault. It's just that that's the nature. Like your mind's not thinking about black people when you're putting together a crypto conference, because you know what? You don't see many black engineers around you. You're not in the circle with the black engineers. You're not in the forum with black engineers. Right. Like they're, they're, it's like you have to think outside of the box. And that's what black Bitcoin billionaires is doing. It's like we're putting up a red, I mean, a, a smoke signal and saying, hey, come over here. We're going to teach you exactly what you'll learn anywhere else. And we want to show you that there are black people who are experts on this stuff as well, so that we can all have a voice because representation matters. If you ever notice my stages, I try to make sure they're as diverse as possible. We got dudes from Bulgaria. We got women on there. We got cats from China. Like we have, like we have all kinds of people on stage because I think everybody needs to have a voice because from those voices is where we get actual change and where we actually can move the needle, right? And, th and those voices will help us figure out how to get to mass adoption. Because until we start like finding ways to get into these other areas that normally and traditionally have not been marketed to, then it's gonna be hard for us to get to mass adoption. So part of that has to be intentional, right? It has to be an intentional focus on trying to get people in. Otherwise, I mean, it's just going to be all the corporates uh, owning all the Bitcoin and a couple of people. And we're going to look at look back and be like, the system looks exactly the same as it did. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, I, I totally see it. Like, it's like, how do you market towards a certain demographic? Right. Like, I don't think, do you think it's intentional? I don't, I don't know if it's intentional, right? It's just probably just ignorance. To, to a certain degree. Or... That's what I said. I don't think it's intentional. I think you have to be intentional if you want to market that way. Right? Yeah. Like you have to say, you know what? We're missing. Somebody here is missing. <laughs> let's go find, let's go find some people like that. Because how do we get to mass adoption without like getting to those people? Right? right? Like, go, let's we we need to go to Africa or we need to go to China or we need to go, right? Even from that standpoint, it's like if we really want this thing to do what we believe it to do and be ubiquitous and on uh, those things and, and have mass adoption, we have to reach people that we normally are not thinking about reaching, you know? Well, that's another beauty of Bitcoin too. Like people, like particularly in Africa and like Nigeria right now, people are turning to it because of the utility it provides, like it, it markets itself in a sense, right? Like the, the freedom that it enables the, sound monetary properties that it has and, and the ability to send it in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion markets itself to, to a certain extent, right? Right. Can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Because when the call came through, it took it off of, uh, like, off of stereo, I mean, off of a speakerphone, so I can barely hear you. So I'm trying to figure out how to get that back. But yeah, I'm, I'm good. I just don't want to do this because if you record it, I'll be like this. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> no. So in terms of like how Bitcoin helps the black community in particular, I mean, I think of it because like I actually went to college in Chicago and I went to DePaul University and I actually volunteered, helped start like an, uh, an inner city lacrosse program called Al's Lacrosse where we went into like um, West Lawndale on the south side of Chicago and used the sport of lacrosse as a, like a vehicle to, to provide kids with an after school option where they can learn leadership skills and team sports skills. And just going through Lawndale and, and the south side, it's just like you see um, payday lending spot after payday lending spot and like food deserts. Like people are certainly like marketed bad. Right. Like 
bad financial practices, like right in the That's intentional. Too. <laughs> right? Like, no, we've seen it with like Wachovia and Steve Munchenbunts, other, otherwise known as Steve Nunchen, like when he was there, like they, uh, before the financial crisis and after, like targeted these, these communities with, with bad mortgage loans. And um, it, it, there is like a, a, uh, a predat- predatory like, vibe that you get like, when you're, when you're, when you're walking through some of these neighborhoods, like why, why are you like, why does this payday lending thing have a bunch of lights on it and like inciting you to, to go get like a 20% interest two week loan? It doesn't make right. a lot of sense. And so like Bitcoin, like providing the, the potential to, to get away from that by providing individuals with a vehicle through which they can actually save capital and have it increase in value seems like a massive opportunity to, to sort of turn the tides um, in right. these neighborhoods specifically. No, and that, that's exactly right, man. So, and that's the other part, right? Because we know how powerful it is. And that's why we have to market it. Because like you said, that was extra, like a lot of that stuff. If you look in these communities, you see lottery posters more. You see checking the cash type spots more. Like you see, um, what do you call them? Like those uh, green dot cards that charge crazy fees. Mm-hmm. Those, are, those, are beef, those are far, uh, they are far greater uh, use in those communities because they're marketed there, right? And that's intentional. So now we have to be intentional about marketing Bitcoin into these same communities so that, like you said, there is an actual option that is sound money. Um, and that's literally what we're trying to do in the Black Bitcoin Billionaire. So a lot of our uh, programs and events we have are purely education. It's literally just to get people from point zero to point one, go from to go from not knowing anything about Bitcoin to a lot of times us giving them their first Bitcoin. And shout out to uh, Cash App, like you said, Cash App has sponsored our club, um, and they've also sponsored this uh, Black Bitcoin, <laughs> Black Bitcoin Billionaire Satoshi Millionaire Challenge. That sounds funny, but the Satoshi Millionaire Challenge, where we're trying to encourage as many black families as we can to at least become Satoshi millionaires. So have at least a million Satoshis. I coined that on Twitter and we just ran with it. It was like, I said, I'm not gonna call anybody a millionaire anymore unless they have a million Satoshis. And so now it's like, we're running with that and we're trying to get people to understand the value of it. Even if you don't spend any more, if you don't buy any more Bitcoin, like we want you to understand, like if you, cause I don't, here's what I believe. If you become a Satoshi millionaire, you're going to buy more Bitcoin, right? right? It's like the people I gave $10 of Bitcoin to, they're buying more Bitcoin, right? Back in the day. It's like, if we can get you to become a social millionaire and we teach you all the principles and, and things about it, also teach you how to work with the protocol and the, and everything else, right, around it, then what happens is, is that you're going to be empowered. And once you're empowered, you don't like to be controlled anymore. <laughs> So once you become empowered and understand that you're empowered, you're probably going to go buy a movie. Like you're probably going to understand it from a standpoint of, I need to accumulate as much of this as I possibly can. And I think if we can get that message out there, I think that that is adding a whole nother group of individuals that normally weren't even marketed to that then change the entire landscape of what we see as Bitcoin of it becoming more mass adopted anyway. I think so many people focus on the corporates but I think it's the grassroots that is going to actually take us over the hump. I think it's those those people are in our families that, you know, once they understand it and they get involved, because if you think about it, we're the ones that pay the corporates. They don't have profits without us buying their stuff. So right. if we're making a conscious decision to stop buying some of the bull crap they put out and buy more Bitcoin, then the corporates aren't going to be as important as the people who are on the street buying the Bitcoin. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Like hopefully this could like that. My, my view of Bitcoin is that like it'll, it'll drive things to a, to a hyper local level where you'll have a lot more small businesses. You'll have a lot stronger communities. And like, again, because people aren't focused on consuming like the next big thing, whether it be a pair of shoes or like whatever the fuck it may be. Like there's not going to be people 
Like I used to like be like a Supreme head, like waiting for like the next Supreme drop to to drop. And like, and I'm like, why, why the fuck would I ever do that? Like now I can't. You became a daddy. <laughs> right? Yeah. It was like, all right, it's time to grow up. So you don't need to be clout chasing with Supreme anymore. But no, like I love the gamification of like and the, the simple goal of get to Satoshi Millionaire, which is achievable, right? Like it, at, at this point it is. And it's getting further away. Like Satoshi Millionaire is like $470 now which is right. crazy to think of, but the gamification of that. And I really like what you said, like, once you get there, it's like, all right, like I'm seeing what this is doing. I'm seeing like that this is increasing in value and uh, I'm learning. So like uh, I'm actually becoming smarter because I'm learning about this asset that I'm, that I'm buying. And I, I really like that gamification. And I agree with what you said. Once they get there, they're so going to want to get more. And I think it's very important. Like it's Satoshi millionaire, the phrase like it, helping get past the unit bias and, and the, that naturally just lets people know that you don't have to buy a whole Bitcoin, right? Because right. that's one thing that people see the price are like, oh, I can't afford that. It's like, no, you can buy Satoshi, so you buy sats. And I, I really admire that, that um, like inciting people to, to try to get, become Satoshi millionaires. I think that's incredible. Like, and so like how, like what type of successes have you seen since you started this clubhouse group? Like, man, crazy. So we've only been around a month and two weeks now. We probably have, I think, 35 to 36,000 members followers. Um, we've given out probably more than $5,000 before we even had the sponsorship. And that was just from a community of people who just wanted to give money to help newbies. Um, it's been such a, empowering thing to see people give back to other people just because because they understand the power of bitcoin and what bitcoin has done for them as far as allowing them to be able to to, to grow and gain wealth and so people are donating um i mean i'm gonna have to really do some accounting on my cash app because because <laughs> I'm, I'm literally trying to make sure all the money that comes in goes out so i can show my accountant at the end of the year look Everything that came in was a gift and I gave a gift. So I have no income from this, um, but it's been, it's been extremely, extremely dope. I've been giving Bitcoin for a very long time, but not at this level because out of all the people we bring on stage and give Bitcoin to them directly and get them their first wallet and get them Bitcoin in there. It's like there are probably for every one person that we brought up, there's probably four or five people who are just in the crowd that follow the instructions and they also have their first Bitcoin. And we have people hop on stage and announce that they are Satoshi millionaires over and over again. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And like, what are like, what are like some of the stories of like learning that's been going on? Like, are, are people having like a, like an aha moment? Like, oh, I'd never really understood money. Like this is, this is helping me understand what's fucked up about our system. Right. That's the, that's the aha moment. Um, somebody wrote on Twitter. They said, I have been trying to orange peel my wife for years now and she just listened to me uh listened to a one black bitcoin billionaire session and she she took the orange peel and i think what it is is that we talk about it from a different perspective right like last night somebody was like how much money should i put into uh to this bitcoin and i said well listen name me something in your life that you can live without that you know good and well you shouldn't be spending your money on everything she said them crab legs i'm always eating crab legs I said, I said, listen, I said, take $7, go get you some imitation crab, take the rest of that money and buy Bitcoin every week. <laughs> right? Because that's a different mentality. Like, I don't know how many people would come from that angle, but that's just because like, that's, that's, it's like, it's different strokes for different folks. Like some of the Bitcoin clubs on Clubhouse are very intellectual and very technical. Um, some of them are comedy, <laughs> you know what I mean? They, they joke around. Some of them are so supremely Bitcoin maximalist that a new person that comes in will get their head chopped off, even though they have, you know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, I've been there. I mean, I'm a Bitcoin yeah. maximalist here, but I try to yeah, be nice too, too. But you know what I'm saying? But they have no, but those new people have no idea. So to come yeah. to walk in and just get your head chopped off is kind of like, oh my gosh. Right. So we tend to be a lot more cordial. We tend to be a lot more soft, understanding that people are infants in this space. Like they have no clue. They just saw a headline that said Dogecoin. And so they're like, my friend told me to get Dogecoin. And so then we have to kind of walk them off the edge and explain to them by math, 
by network effect. And so they start understanding why Bitcoin. You get right. what I'm saying? No, and but that's like, that's been really cool stuff. about Clubhouse yeah. in general, like going out throughout all the, the rooms. Like it helps you practice how to get a noob from zero to like understanding Bitcoin. Like, all right, I should probably focus on Bitcoin. Um, right. In the quickest right. way that I've experienced through any social media or, or content. Media. Right. It's insane, like the, the types of conversations you can have on there and how in depth you can get and like different perspectives. Like if you come up short uh, on, on a certain explanation, somebody can step in behind you and add on to what you said and, and add a different perspective and, and right. strengthen the argument. You're not like one on one. Yeah, it's so sick. And that's and in our group, we tend to allow for debates. I remember uh, who said that Corey was like, uh, he said, yeah, Lamar, you guys are a lot more patient with uh, these Ethereum guys, but that's because we really want to allow for debate because when you allow for debate, it's again, it's about access to information, right? We don't want to cut off any information, even if it's misinformation, because the more information you have, the more you'll recognize misinformation, right? The more information you get, you can start to triangulate and say, oh, this person's a crock of bull. He don't know what they're talking about. And so what we do is we just allow for that debate because we want people to hear all the sides and make the decision for themselves. Cause that's what Bitcoin is, man. It, it allows you to, as a matter of fact, let's just say cryptocurrency. It allows you to make the decision for yourself. And I'm not going to sit here and try to preach you into Bitcoin. Like do what you want, lose all the money you want to. I like, as, <laughs> I lost a lot of money on penny stocks, right? But me losing a lot of money on penny stocks actually helped me figure out how to invest. And it actually has served me well over my life. A person who didn't come from much, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it served me really, really well. Like when I was 19, I was on welfare with my wife. You feel what I'm saying? Like we were on welfare, food stamps, the whole nine, like trying to just make it. And I taught myself, I was, the penny stock set me back, right? When I was 17, I turned 19. It's like, I'm starting to learn, but I was able to build up enough money that by the time I was 22, I could buy my first duplex, right? And then I was able to use that and more money I invested in stocks to then buy two cold stones, right? But all of that came from me losing with penny stocks. <laughs> like it came from me going down that rabbit hole of, man, I can't believe I lost this money and I lost my dad's money. Cause I'm, t- I'm so excited. I'm like, damn, we need to get in the stocks, man. Da, 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 da. He's like, son, whatever you want, let's go down here. So he set up a Merrill Lynch account. I'll never forget it. I couldn't even invest. So I gave the money to him to go invest it for us with, with the broker at Merrill Lynch. And of course the fees were crazy. And then it's like, we lose all the money. My pops, he wasn't really that upset. And me, I was super mad. Cause I'm like, I got my dad in it. We lost this money. Like it's crazy. But after that, it was like, from that point forward, I was on a different path of education and watching CNBC constantly and just trying to learn the lingo, right? And I think the same thing can happen in this cryptocurrency space because what's going to happen, we can warn them all day. I can tell you all day, like, look, that Ula Ula coin that you saw on page 54 of Coin Market Cap, <laughs> like, yeah, it looks like it's under a penny and it looks like if you buy a lot of them, but let me explain to you about liquidity. Let me explain to you that if you start buying those and the price gets high, you might not have nowhere to sell them. Let me tell you about slippage, right? Let me tell you about a platform that doesn't even exist. Go to the go to Coin Market site and, uh, Cap and look at their, their site. There's no site there anymore, but you want to get the coin, right? So you start educating from that point, and it's like, well, that's fine. You can still go get it. If you can find it, go get it. But in your in the back of your mind, you know they'll be back. But it's like it's like you have to let people go through that sometimes, right? You got to let them learn that lesson for themselves sometimes. You can warn them all, the, all, all you want. But once they go through that lesson, then they come back. It's the man at the, it's the, it's, it's my theory of the man at the bottom of the mountain. So many people pass the old man up at the bottom of the mountain as if he hasn't climbed it before. And they go up and come back down and, and can't ever get to the top. And they walk right back by the man at the bottom of the mountain. And some wise person looks and says, hey, man, you ever uh, climbed this mountain before? And he says, well, of course, a hundred times. And that person is the one that gets to the top of the mountain because the man at the bottom has been up a hundred times and you at least ask him a question. Most people walk past the man at the bottom of the mountain because they just so gung-ho about climbing the mountain. All they see is the mountain. They see the prestige, the glory. The, they see the $4 million they make on Dogecoin, even though if they made $4 million, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. They, they see all of that stuff and that's what gets them hyped. And they tell their friends, well, I made it halfway up the mountain, not knowing that, the rest, there is no rest of the mountain for Dogecoin. 
Like, if it got to the level that most people think they wanted to get to, it would be more valuable than gold. <laughs> right? It's crazy. I like that that uh, that parable or that that story. Yeah, the, old yeah, man. the man at the bottom. I, I talk about that all the time because that's what we do, man. And and I, But I truthfully believe, because think about it. You didn't hear me say the man at the bottom of the mountain is stopping every person. Hey, what are you doing? Hey, no, the man at the bottom of the mountain just sitting there waiting. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to sit here and tell you and, and try to, you know, talk and stop every single person. You got to come and, and seek this knowledge. Right. That's a very and then good once, point. You, once you start to seek the knowledge, that's what you start to see. Right. You've seen it probably time and time again. You try to tell people about the mountain. Right. You try to tell people about Bitcoin and they shoot you down. It ain't backed by anything. It's not right. Yep. And then what happens is you leave them alone because you're like, you know what? I'm not getting through. Right. And the next and the next thing that happens is the price goes to the moon. And then, hey, um, you know that Bitcoin you were talking about? What's going right? on? Yeah, what's, what's going, going on with on? that? Can you tell me more about it? And now you, Mr. Man at the bottom of the mountain, start telling them about, start orange pilling them, so to speak. Yeah. She'll That's lightly. how it is, man. Man at the bottom of the mountain. The man has touched the stove, right? That's yeah, like same thing. Touching the stove. Everybody's got to do it. I agree. Like trying to be forceful. I, I get the intention. I've been very guilty of it myself. Of <laughs> trying to, um, I'm trying to like help people avoid the, the pitfalls of getting into alts and um, like the low, low probability of actually keeping your Bitcoin or increasing it even. Right. Um, but yeah, like people have to be receptive and want to learn. And like look for wisdom like you can't right. just be like don't get in the shit coins right uh, you can but it's not effective yeah and then they'll learn nothing hey nothing's better than that pain buddy nothing oh. nothing teaches better than pain yeah it was like 2013 2014 that altcoin bubble oh. that's, that's all it took for me to learn your <laughs> your your son is going to prove that to you more than you even know <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> like like, let him walk under the table one time and hit his head. Oh, oh, he's done every, that plenty of times already. Every table becomes a duck after that, right? Yeah. Every table, he ducks every time, right? There's nothing like pain that, that to teach you a lesson. Like, the wise people realize that the people who've been through, the person with the knot on their head already is the person you should listen to, right? But most people got to go get that knot themselves before they actually listen, man. Right. So, no, I think there's... The beauty of where we are right now in 2021, particularly in the Bitcoin context, there's so many wise men who have touched the stove. Yes. If you're willing to approach the the education of this in a, a tempered manner, if you will, the, the the ability to help others avoid others who are looking for advice, avoid touching the stove is is better than it ever has been. It's crazy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That stuff's gonna change the world, man. That's man. what I think. I believe that's his day one. <laughs> like, as soon as I read that white paper, I was like, my gosh, who is this Satoshi Nakamoto? Now I think Satoshi Nakamoto is a seven-foot Mexican woman. Like, <laughs> that's that's what alien? I tell everybody. I just can't, like, I really just cannot believe that one singular man, right? Because some people think it's a team, some people think it's a man. I can't believe that one singular man would, would build something this amazing and not stand up and beat his chest about it. Like, I don't know too many men like that. It's like, it's got very religious connotations, right? The Genesis block, it's like... Oh, true, true. I'm going to selfless as a Jesus Christ or something like that, right? At the end of right. the day, like... And, and that, that, I mean, up to this point, obviously, Satoshi hasn't revealed himself and hasn't moved any of his coins. And like, if that continues into the future, like that selfless sacrifice that he made to not reveal his identity and take any fame for it and then not profit from the coins that he mined. Like right. The ultimate sacrifice for humanity to get this, this system that could free us from this, this <laughs> debt slavery, man. It'd be, if it continues going this way. It, man, you it, just made, that's crazy. You just made it go full circle for me because I always talk about debt slavery, but I never thought about it. Like Bitcoin is the salvation for debt slavery. That's crazy. Yeah, it's the, it's the underground railroad, man. <laughs> it's like if, you can either come, you can either come get free, or you can stay in that same system forever. Right, and it's like it's, it feels like it's happening, right? Like 
feels like more people are waking up to it, being more receptive to it. Like the the access to Bitcoin, like being able to go to Cash App and go to the third tab and buy like five dollars worth. Right, it's getting out there. I mean, no, like, that's it's powerful. Right, and the 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 amount of education and content around it is is hitting a uh, an inflection point, a tipping point, if you will, where that's what's the beauty of like clubhouse is to me. You can have like 10 different Bitcoin rooms at the same time, like cumulatively with like 10,000 people. Right. It's like educators of different, uh, different perspectives in the Bitcoin world, just educating people who need to hear a certain perspective to understand it, which is, yep. uh, ah, I'm happy yeah, to be could, alive right now, man. You could, find, <laughs> look, you can, <laughs> you could find, you could find your professor, man. Yeah, you can you can find the person that teaches you the way you can understand it in in Clubhouse, and that's what's so powerful about Clubhouse, man. Like, I have about I have a group with twenty five thousand people, and then I have another group with like one hundred and thirty seven thousand people on Facebook, and another one with like five thousand. But this one on Clubhouse is completely different. Why, like, what, is, why do you say that? Because it's like from a from an onboarding perspective, right? It's almost like it's almost like onboarding on steroids. So, like you said, you have a sponsorship with Cash App, right? Yeah. And so, and so we have a sponsorship with Cash App as well. And one of the things I try to convey was I have onboarded probably more people into Cash App <laughs> than I did even into my Fever Wallet. You know what I'm saying? Like myself, because Fever Wallet took off because it was the only thing, and so other people were doing it. But me personally. Like in that little short period of time, I probably got more people with Bitcoin in a wallet than I did when I was doing Fever, which is nuts to me. Like it's this fast. Cause like you said, literally what you just said, I can say, go to your cash app, hit the fourth tab, hit the buy, uh, hit the Bitcoin, hit the buy button and you have Bitcoin. Then they go, Oh my God. Right. It's like that fast. Right. Like, That's like, a, and I, and it's, it's hard for people to believe it's that accessible. Like, again, we were talking about like having to be an institutional investor to, to get into like startups and stuff like that. There's that barrier to entry. And I think there's this preconceived notion out there that's like, ah, oh, Bitcoin's too hard to get. It's like too, too much effort, like too much right. money. It's like, no, you can go on cash app and buy $5 worth right now. If you want to right now. And then when they see this one woman, she keeps coming back in because we got her in really early. Because when we first started talking about Satoshi Millionaire, I think it was $230. <laughs> and so she keeps coming in going, oh, my gosh, my 10 looks like 20. I She'll say something like that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she was like, I'm making this money. And this is crazy. Like, I've never had anything that's making money this fast. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, it just, like, uh, that's why I say the best way to teach somebody is to give it to them first and then let them research later. Like, let them research why they have it in their pocket. Because nothing, nothing speaks to them louder than the appreciation of it. Because as the, as the, as the value goes up, and all the, shall I say the price goes up, the value is, is, it's not even, we don't have a price for the actual value yet. It's still undervalued to me. Yeah, it's extremely I mean, un, undervalued. underpriced, underpriced, I should say. Um, but when they see that, it, that is the thing. Because then they go, Omar, should I get some more? Like, what should I, and like, and like the whole conversation changes then. It's like, I, I gave a dude $10, like 2014, I think. And he took half of it and used it. And the other half is worth $2,200 at this point. So right. that $5 looks like 22. And I, I didn't believe, I was like, there's no way, man. He shot me the, the image of what I sent to him. And I was like, my gosh, like, this is wild. Yeah, no, that, was, that was my move too, back in like the 2014, 2015 eras like i'd go to bars with friends they'd be like download coinbase like at the time that was like the only app they could download and like right. i'll give you i'll send you five bucks worth and like i had friends who like deleted the app forgot about it and then like 2017 remembered they're like oh my god they're like i owe you dinner Damn. Like, this is this is insane and that, that right. is like like giving it to them and them just seeing because they don't have any they didn't give up any of their own money to get it right so they're like ah somebody just gave it to me like uh it's uh it's just sitting there like i, I fuck it, I'll just hold on to it. And then over the years, they see how much it increases in value. Like, holy shit, I should be paying attention to this. Very effective way to get people in. 
crazy, man. Crazy. Well, look, man, listen, I think we're going to, you have to check it out. We, we're trying to get the uh, CEO of Blockfolio into the room. Is he, is this going on right now as we speak? Yeah, see, I was in the room. I don't know. Some people keep calling me. I think they probably told me they're trying to go back into the room or something. Damn, I'm losing you, Lamar. Are you losing me? Oh, there um, you go. There you go. Yeah, because I, like I said, when people call me, it messes up my sound. On and I don't know how to reset it. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. But yeah, man. So, um, yeah, this is this has been an awesome, awesome conversation, man. Like, I didn't. Yeah. To be honest, I didn't even know. I hadn't heard of tales from the crib. Hey. Like, I had. Yeah. I hadn't heard of, until you reached out. I was like, man, I like. I love the name. We're we're in a dirty part of the internet. It's hard to find us sometimes. You know? <laughs> Look, uh, no, hey. No. I know you look, your wife gotta be close by because I just saw you turn red as heck when you said it. Uh, no, she's downstairs. I think it's it's one of the running jokes is that you can the freaks, we call everybody freaks on Tales from the Crypt. So you gotta be a freak That's if you. you're into this stuff in a good way. It's an endearing term. But yeah, we 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 congregate on a dirty part of the internet and talk about Bitcoin. Well, this is uh Tales That's from the Crypt. Funny. Well, I'm glad I'm glad I found you. I'm glad you found Yeah, Tales I'm glad I found you, man um yeah i'm pumped to get this out and yeah keep crushing it man that's like we need more bitcoin evangelist like the grassroots effort of the system this protocol is the beauty of it right i think it's you don't need a central bank shilling the dollar it's just like the individuals using bitcoin recognizing its power and its freedom enabling power specifically like getting it into other individuals hands and again like we need to get away from this narrative that is ripping people who have more in common with each other apart compared to the people right. forcing the narratives on them like bitcoin helps us meet and work together around this apolitical protocol that'll set us free yeah it connect it connects us man it's like i always say it's the it's the nation without borders oh yeah it's the uh the digital nation like it's right. gonna bring i think it's gonna bring peace i think it's gonna bring humanity oh, for sure together. And, for uh, sure man yeah because think about it the only thing that has us always fighting is freaking borders anyway <laughs> yeah that like borders of narrative borders of conversation like it's, right. it's always of... yeah it's like everybody really is mixed like everybody usually is right down the middle it's like they got a little bit of everything in them. nobody's all one thing man. E even if they try to play it on tv <laughs> it's you know uh... what i'm saying yeah, yeah, it's dissolving these borders, right? Like you can literally send money across borders. There's nothing anybody can do about it. There's no sanction, no, no regulation that could stop you from doing it. And so, right, keep crushing it, dude. Um, well, thank you, brother. Yeah. And look, okay. I would love to come on again if you would have me, man. I like this. I, I to be honest, man, I like your your style, bro. Oh, You're like you, a dude. jazz musician of podcasts, man. <laughs> Like, it's so smooth, bro. Like, it's smooth. I'm like, yeah, I like this conversation, man. It's oh. that chill, you know what I mean? It's just, uh, thank you. I appreciate that. It's just free-flowing. Let's go. I mean, it's easy. It's easy when you're talking about Bitcoin with, with freedom fighters, so. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. With the, with the rebellion. Right. <laughs> We're going to win. We're going to win. I believe that, too, boy. Um, I believe that, too. Well, well, look, they said, yeah, they said the CEO of, of FTX is on right now. They, that's why everybody's hitting all right. All right. You get on there. You got to go do your duty. Thank you for coming yeah. on. I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your night, dude. Uh, of course, yeah, I'll see you, you too, on Clubhouse. Man. I'll see you around Clubhouse. Yeah, I'll see you there. All right. <laughs> Later, bro. See you, dude.